epigenetic echoes. What on earth is this crazy professor going to try and tell me in the next few minutes? I want to introduce you to an emerging science that promises to uncover for us the origins of life and in doing so, lead potentially quite rapidly to some transformation in healthcare. It requires a marriage between mathematicians and biologists, between computer scientists and physicians, and it's of special interest to cancer biologists. Not only is it fascinating scientists, but it's also grabbing the attention of the general public. And I hope that many of you may have seen this last night, the first in the series of Countdown to Life, The Extraordinary Making of You, which describes some of our work in the Gambia as we try to understand how a mother's diet in the days around conception can affect the health of that baby you see there. Not only as it emerges a few hours earlier from the womb, but how it will affect that baby's health for the rest of its life. Let's start at the very beginning. This lovely electron micrograph captures the moment at which a human sperm meets a human egg. Now this has been a tremendous journey. That sperm has had to compete against millions of others and swim what for it would be an enormous journey up the fallopian tube and find the egg. But that's the easy bit. <laughs> then it starts to get complicated. The 50% of the father's DNA that's contained in that sperm has to intermingle with the 50% of the mother's DNA that's in the egg in order to make the new you. A few hours later, that single cell will divide into two. And a few hours later, those two cells will divide again into two more to make four. Then eight, 16, 32, 64, and so on. And a couple of days later, it'll look like this. A small mass of cells that is just embedding itself on the uterus wall. Now, each of these cells contains an identical genetic code. 8,000 million base pairs, the length of 800 Bibles of information, which is faithfully transcribed with almost no errors every time the cell has to divide. So each cell containing the same bit of information, how can they turn into different cells that create a human being? And that's where epigenetics comes in. The epi in epigenetics means above, upon. These are messages that are written on top of the genetic code, on top of our basic DNA, and give instructions as to how the cells should read and express the DNA. It's an incredibly complicated story, as you can easily see from this picture, which is one of thousands that are now appearing in journals. How can any single human mind make sense of all this information? It's quite impossible. And so we need a new breed of biologists. We call them bioinformaticians, who are very skilled mathematicians who can look at this data and triage it and dig down to find the occasional diamond that will tell us what has gone wrong in a disease and how we might be able to alter that. Now, there are many, many mechanisms by which epigenetic messages can be encoded. Here are just a few of them here. You'll see those, what look like balls of wool, nucleosomes. When DNA is wrapped tightly around that, the machinery that translates the DNA, that translates the code, cannot get at it. So any gene that is wrapped tightly will be silenced. But there are processes which can unwrap it. They're histones, and they can be modified to give a signal. Unwrap this bit, let the cell read it, or wrap it up again. And that's happening in all of you, second by second, as you sit here digesting your breakfast. There are slower processes, microRNAs. Thousands of these are known, well, at least a thousand are known. Uh, which can be transferred from cell to cell throughout life and carry a message forward in regard of early exposures in a person. The one I'm going to talk about today is methylation. Now, there are at least 30 million points along our DNA in which they can be labelled by adding on a methyl group. 
And when that methyl group is laid on, again, the machinery that transcribes the DNA cannot get at it. It can't read the gene, so it silences it. <coughs> we can use music as really a very effective analogy as to what's going on here. So here's a piece of bark, a very famous piece of bark, and you can see that the notes there are the DNA code. <coughs> that piece of bark is always the same piece of bark, whether it's played on a lute or a harpsichord, and we can recognize that. But it can be interpreted in different ways. Let's just now listen to two clips which make that point. <coughs> Mark, Mark Hert, Matt Hertzkowitz giving us a classical interpretation, as most people would play it. Now let's hear the same piece of music in a little bit further on, interpreted in a jazz manner. So you see, the same piece of DNA can be expressed very differently in order to create those different cells. Now, as composing advanced, and indeed we can use this as an analogy of higher organisms, as things became more complicated, composers started to write down the instructions as to how they'd like the DNA of their music to be interpreted. We have guidance as to how fast and in what way it should be played. The composer says, play this little bit quietly, pianissimo. In genetic terms, that's a repressor, a gene being silenced. Or alternatively, fortissimo, let's hear this loud, express this part of the gene many times over, uh, let's hear it within the cell. And we have transitions uh, between those two different extremes. So that's an analogy of what's going on in terms of the human cell. Now, things are complicated. And I'm only able to show you the very surface of the complexities. So, after conception, the epigenetic marks that are born on the father's sperm and the mother's egg are wiped clean. This process of wiping occurs very rapidly on the father's sperm. It's as if the egg doesn't want it there. She's scrubbing the DNA clean and getting rid of almost all the epigenetic information that has come from the father. The mother's DNA is also cleaned, but not aggressively so. The cleaning here happens just because it's not uh, recapitulated every time the cell divides, so gradually it disappears. And then a few days later, it's all laid back down again, and in different ways, in different lineages of cells that will become a heart cell or an eye cell, or a brain cell. But something else interesting happens. There's a class of gene called imprinted genes. We don't fully understand why genes are imprinted, but an imprinted gene is where only one copy of the gene is ever read, either the mother's copy or the father's copy. And in order for that to be the case, these need to be protected from this process of the cleaning of the DNA and the re-establishment in the very early embryo. As I say, we don't fully understand why that occurs, but we know that it's incredibly important in terms of placental and fetal development. Now here are the poster mice, the poster children of epigenetics. These are two agouti mice, a picture taken by my great collaborator Rob Waterland from Houston. And he was famous for demonstrating that a mother's diet at the time of conception can change whether a mouse looks small and brown or large and golden. These mice are identical sisters. They're born in the same litter, but look how different they are. One of them, small, brown, lean and healthy. The other, beautifully golden, but massively obese and hence develops diabetes and dies much younger. The same genotype, but a different expression and that expression is determined by what the mother 
eats at the time of conception. So, that was great. We understand that occurs in mice, but does it occur in humans? And we set to test that in an intriguing experiment of nature that we were very fortunate to have in our setting in rural Gambia. So if we went a couple of months ago to Gambia, it would look like this. Incidentally, our lab is in those trees just north of the bear patch there, which is the ubiquitous football pitch in every African village. We've been working here for many years. And this issue of the seasonality has intrigued us, because if you went there today, it would look like that. And this change in the rainfall patterns creates a completely different nutritional scenario at the different times of year. Mothers eat very different foods. At this time of year, they're able to eat far more green, leafy vegetables and a much more varied diet. Now, some years ago, tw almost 20 years ago now, we had observed that something very profound happens in relation to the exact month in which a baby is born, which is in turn related to this seasonality. Here's a graph of the survival of 3,200 people that we've been following. And you'll see that in young childhood, there's no difference between those two lines, really. But then something profound happens at puberty, and they start to stretch apart. Now, we've, if we look at this section here, we've just reanalyzed these recently, and we kind of expected the phenomenon may have disappeared. But far from disappearing, it's got even stronger. And if you are born in the hungry season, you're over seven times more likely to die as a young adult than if you're born in the harvest season. So that's a very profound effect. And how could that be? How could an early exposure lay dormant within the organism for 20 or so years and then suddenly be exposed in such a virulent way? Well, of course, we're intrigued to ask the question as to whether this is down to epigenetics. Now, those methyl groups that I told you about need a lot of nutrients in order to be produced. And here are some of the pathways. This, incidentally, is just a glimpse of the central pathways. We need some intermediate metabolites, S-adenosine methionine, S-adenosine homocysteine, the details don't matter, but the ratio of those are important in terms of driving how many methyl groups are available. And those, in turn, are affected by all of these nutrients. The B vitamins, folic acid, riboflavin, B6, B12, choline, choline betaine, and methionine are particularly important. So we ask the question whether mother's diets altered in these in the different seasons? And as you can see here, the answer was indeed yes. You'll see the different yellow and blue patterns in those heat maps according to uh, the metabolites measured in mother's blood in the hungry season and the harvest season. And on the other side, you see the, if you look at the green line, you'll see that this ratio, the SAM to SAR ratio, which we believe is particularly important, is very different at two different times of year. So the question was, does this affect the epigenome of the baby? Now, I just need to introduce you to another friend of mine, metastable epialleles. Don't worry about what they are. It took me years to get my head around it. But the simple message is that if we study these particular special genes, we can tell that the action, the biological action, has occurred in the very first few hours or days after conception. So it's just a, a device we use to be able to nail the time at which things have happened. So we looked at seven of these and we asked the question, are they different in babies who are conceived at different seasons? And the answer is yes, they were different. Now, that might not look very big differences, but these are very tightly biologically controlled uh, processes. And in fact, differences this big are very meaningful. But the next question was, well, what are these genes doing? What's that going to matter to the baby? And for a while, the answer was, we have no idea. We chose these genes simply because they were metastable epialleles as a device to look at early gestation. We had no idea what they were doing. But then we made a subsequent breakthrough. It's in terms of this gene here, VTRNA2-1. Again, the details don't matter to you, except to say that this is a crucial gene at the center of immunometabolism. It affects our susceptibility to viral infections, and later in life it becomes a tumor suppressor gene. 
So highly likely to have an important effect on human health. And we see something fascinating going on here. I told you about imprinted genes. Now this is an imprinted gene. It's maternally imprinted. The mother's copy should be 100% methylated and the father's copy should be clean. And so if we measure the average DNA methylation, we should get 50%. And indeed, for the vast majority of children, we get, give or take, 50%. But look what's happened in those primarily that are conceived in the dry season. They've lost this methylation. The biology has gone wrong. And there's another group here with an intermediary uh, effect. And this is highly significantly determined by the season of conception, and we believe by the mother's diet. So this gene is just acting as a canary in the coal mine, if you like. It's a good example of something that really matters and is affected by the mother's diet. We already have evidence that there are many more behaving like this. So, where can this take us? Can some of this basic discovery science lead to something that will actually be useful to the world? Can we design next generation interventions that are going to make a difference to mothers and babies? And we believe the answer is yes. If we can work out more of the details as to how a mother's diet at the time of conception affects these epigenetic processes and how those epigenetic processes affect disease patterns, cancers, diabetes, obesity, then in principle we should be able to advise mothers what they should eat before conception, or even design supplements for them that would help to clean up all these errors that occur when the diet is suboptimal. And so that's our long-term aim, and we hope with further endeavour that we'll get there before too long. Thank you.